that I would somehow end up on the streets as a 13-year-old runaway and later sentenced to a life sentence as a 16-year-old. So I grew up in a middle-class military family with two loving parents who had never run afoul of the law. There was never a time that I went to bed hungry or didn't have shoes on my feet, clothes on my back. I went to church every Sunday morning and Wednesday night, whether I wanted to or not. And my parents did the best they could to shield me from whatever they considered to be a negative influence. If you look at the common precursors to exploitation or to criminal justice involvement, you would have never looked twice in my direction. But all that changes whenever you start to look at my life within the public education system. For young people, school is where you go out and you begin to form relationships outside of your family and close family friends. It's your first real introduction into the community. And from the first day that I started school, I was treated as an outcast. Everyone's parents had got to bring them into the classroom since it was the first day. And while my mom and dad spoke to the teacher, I sat down and started to get acquainted with some of my classmates. As everyone in this room knows, children can be brutally honest. Uh, I went home quite a few times for taking notes, uh, taking notes home for saying things that I shouldn't have, kind of like when I told the teacher that she needed the gum that she was telling me to spit out because her breath was the one that was stank. Did not go over well at all. Um, but anyways, I hadn't been sitting at my desk for maybe 10 minutes when one of the kids had asked me why my parents didn't look like me. And it's not something that I had ever given much thought to because no one in my family had ever made me feel that I didn't belong. Um, so I never really entertained the possibility that we didn't match. But in that moment, looking up at the front of the classroom at my two very dark-skinned parents and back down at my light skin, confusion just started to settle in. So when my mom came to pick me up from school later that afternoon, I wasted no time asking her those same questions that had been posed to me. And one question would turn into another, and each answer she provided me left me more confused than the last. I was adopted, she said. Her and my father had adopted me from a white woman who couldn't take care of me, and I was mixed. She tried to reassure me that I was beautiful and I was loved just the way that I was, but a seed of doubt had taken root in my spirit, and I couldn't help but see life through a different lens after that moment. Now I just saw how different I was from everyone. My family, my friends, my classmates, my church members. Everywhere I looked, my mind would automatically find the things that distinguished me from the people around me. I struggled to adapt socially, and in response, I was withdrawn. In the classroom, I preferred to complete my assignments alone without any help from the teachers, and I didn't want to work in groups either. Whenever I rejected help from the teacher or refused to work in these groups, I was always labeled as having a bad attitude. And I found myself constantly at odds with my teachers. I visited the principal's office on a fairly regular basis, and I quickly became known as the bad kid in school. The smallest eye roll or smart remark was all the excuse the teacher needed to get me sent to in-school suspension. And after so many trips of going to ISS, then I found myself being suspended altogether. And the straw that broke the camel's back happened when I was in the sixth grade, and I was expelled for bringing no-dose pills for show and tell. Um, if you don't know what no-dose pills are, they're caffeine pills that anybody can walk into Walmart and get. And for some reason, I don't know why, when I was a child, I felt it was something that I wanted to take to show and tell. The school resource officer felt that it fell under the zero tolerance policy and threatened to have me locked up for bringing drugs to school. Ended up being expelled, and my mother had to take me clear across town and enroll me in an alternative school. And I was only 12 years old, so that made me the youngest person at that school. Most of the other kids there were on some form of probation, 
many of them were already in state custody of some form, whether that meant they were currently in a foster home or they left the facilities they were placed in to come to school, but they were there for things a lot more serious than bringing no-dose pills for show and tell. And less than six months from the time that I started attending that school, I ended up before the juvenile court judge. I caught a charge with three of the older kids that I met there at the school and wound up being sent to a facility. Whenever the judge sent me away, it was the first time that I had ever spent the night away from my parents, other than the little sleepovers that you have with your kids. But this was different because I was in a place surrounded by strangers, had to go to sleep in that place surrounded by strangers, and wasn't even free to move from room to room without permission of some complete stranger. I couldn't even call my own mother without going through some obscure approval process from some random staff member. When I was sent back home to return to public school, now I was more of an outcast than ever before. Um, I was a fugitive. And it was glaringly obvious to me that I was not welcome nor wanted in school, and naturally it wasn't long before they got rid of me again. This time bypassing alternative school altogether and going to the court to have my probation violated. But oddly enough, I remember feeling this sense of relief whenever I was sent back to the facility. Because when I was there, I didn't feel like I was out of place, like I was the bad egg that was constantly being singled out. There I felt like I was among my peers. And so even though I was in a place where every single day there was another fight um, for basic human rights and dignity, I felt that I was where I belonged. But of course being in that place took a toll on me. And so like most kids who find themselves in state facilities, after a while I ended up running away and started living on the streets of Nashville. If I had to pinpoint where things took a turn for the worse, it was definitely that day that I ran away. The three years that followed that decision were hands down, hands down, the most chaotic, traumatic, and reckless times of my life. In that time, I would be raped on numerous occasions. I would be assaulted, threatened, and sold by a man that I thought I loved. And at the close of what was certainly one of the darkest chapters of my life, a man would die at my hands. Every single day that I was on the run, there was this high drama event that played out, and I just slowly became desensitized to a world where everything my mother taught me in between those trips to take me back and forth to church was turned on its head. And as hard as it was living on the streets, once again, I didn't feel like an outcast. So even as things were out there spiraling out of control, I couldn't find it within myself to just go back home to my mom. So even though I was just 13, all the people that I found myself with were all adults. And they had no problem allowing me to do and learn things that no 13-year-old child ever should. These women taught me how to use my companionship and conversation to get money from men. It taught me that my body was a commodity a God-given, money-making tool, and I could either sit on it, play with it, give it away for free, or get paid for it. The way I walked, dressed, talked, even the way the things that I found interesting all revolved around what would please a man when I was living with these women. All the men that I met through them were much older than me, and having sex was nothing more than a means to make sure that I continued to have a place to, to lay my head that I continued to have clothes to put on my back and food to feed myself. But oddly enough, there was something empowering about the effect that I was having on these men. I found a sense of pride in the fact that I was being sought after because of what I could do for them, and it made me feel like I was finally wanted. All these lessons completely altered my worldview when it came to relationships and all the feelings of me wanting to be wanted of me wanting to be included would eventually culminate to me meeting the man that I would later come to know as my trafficker. At the time, I called him my older boyfriend. And I viewed him as the one person in the world who 
didn't care about my flaws or shortcomings and who gave me the attention that I always wanted but never felt worthy enough to receive. His name was Cut, short for Cutthroat, and if anybody in this room would have told me that he was actually a pimp, I would have told you that you were crazy. Even though there were times that I feared him and times that he abused me, the time I spent with him was primarily marked by this longing for approval. One minute he could make me feel like I was just the only girl in the world, and the very next, without any provocation whatsoever, he just seemed to despise me. And I wanted so badly for him to love me that there was nothing he could have asked me to do that I would have told him no. I wanted so badly to stay in his good graces. He quickly picked up on the fact that my entire identity revolved around this need to feel wanted, to be accepted, to just belong. And I believe that if only I could do all the things to make him smile, all the things to make him want me, to make myself appear valuable to him, that we could just have this happily ever after. And each time I realized that although I thought I did good, my best was never really good enough, a small part of me just died. And on August 7, 2004, after sending me from our hotel room for the very last time, after once again walking into a situation where I was in way over my head, I shot and killed the 43-year-old man who picked me up for sex that night. Once again, I found myself going through the court system. I thought back to all those times in ISS, the suspensions, expulsions, those familiar feelings of not feeling heard, of feeling like the outcome was predetermined, was heavy as I made my way through all of the preliminary hearings. The public defender assigned to my case visited me almost every single day. And she seemed so fascinated of all these stories that I had about life on the run. To her, my life seemed like something out of a movie. She would just sit across the table from me with this crazy look on her face as I explained everything about how to navigate life on the streets. And she became just determined to get me to see that the way of life that I come to know was not normal for a 16-year-old. One day after she realized that nothing she could say would convince me in particular that Cut was this boyfriend that I kept calling him, that he didn't love me. She pulled out a notepad. And on this paper, she actually divided it in four sections. She titled them, things that are good about cut, things that are bad about cut. Things cut does to make me feel good, things cut does to make me feel bad. And she had me fill in the paper and just sat quietly as I wrestled with it for a while. And pretty quickly, just like that, a light bulb went off in my head when I realized that I struggled so hard to fill in things that he did to make me feel good. So hard to come up with things that were good about him. But I didn't have enough room on the page to put all the bad things that he did. And it forced me to realize that I had come to a place where how other people felt was more important to me than my own feelings. I had neglected myself for so long that I couldn't even tell you who I was. As I sat there at that table with her, I couldn't come up with a single adjective to describe my personality, my likes, my interests, my talents, my goals or preferences. I had become so consumed with living to please other people that I had just completely lost myself. For the very first time, my eyes had become open and I started evaluating all the other relationships, all the other friendships that I had come to think as normal. And I started, I started to question, question everything that I had ever been told is true and realized that for much of my life I had allowed other people to dictate my thoughts, my actions, the way that I looked at myself. My transfer hearing came around a few months after I was arrested. The prosecutor in my case fought to convince the court that there was nothing left to salvage of my 16-year-old life. And all that was left was to throw me away. In the state of Tennessee, kids who are facing transfer hearings don't really stand much of a chance of being kept in the juvenile system. State statute is very rigid and that the only options that the juvenile court judges have are to remand the child to receive services in juvenile court until their 19th birthday or send them over to adult court where they will stand consequences similar to an adult that was charged with those same charges. In my case, that meant that the judge could send me to the same broken DCS system 
that didn't rehabilitate me the two and a half years I was in his custody, or she could send me over to face trial in adult court where I would face 51 calendar years in prison. In the end, she came to the conclusion that her hands were simply tied. So after she ruled to transfer me to adult court, I had to immediately go up to juvenile court in my cell and pack my bags. And I remember hearing on the TV outside of my cell someone talking. It was actually my district attorney on my case. And he was talking to the news reporters, and I'll never forget his words. He told them she's dangerous. And the public needs to be protected a whole lot more than anything that could possibly be done for her. Since again, I was only 16, once I was transferred to the adult jail later that day, I was placed in solitary confinement. For two years, I was kept in my cell for 23 hours a day. And for one hour each day, I was handcuffed and let out to a shower. I was locked in that shower. Um, I was placed in shackles and allowed to use the phone and allowed to go out from time to time into a dog kennel to walk around someone. Most days, though, the only sunlight that I saw came from a 12-inch window and a concrete wall. And the only human interaction from the guard who was bringing me my food tray. Occasionally, I would get visits from my attorneys and from volunteers from local churches. My mother came to see me on the weekends, but for much of that time, I was alone with my thoughts and with God. After spending two years in solitary confinement, I was released and allowed to live among others on my 18th birthday. It would take months, months, for me to relearn how to do simple things, like have a conversation with other people. When I finally went to trial, a few months after that, I was convicted on all counts and sentenced to life in prison. At one point, the DA showed the jury a naked picture that my trafficker had taken of me that was recovered in the hotel room. To him, it was proof of what an unsavory, horrible person I was. At that time, the term sex trafficking didn't apply to girls like me. The jury never got to hear my side of what happened because my attorneys advised me not to testify. And so I had to sit there with this blank look on my face while a bunch of strangers argued about whether or not I was a monster. Something inside of me woke up after that. I decided that I wasn't just going to be an observer in my own life anymore. And furthermore, I wasn't going to allow anyone to dictate how I would live my life. The judge and the jury may have told me that I was going to spend the rest of my life inside the penitentiary, but what they couldn't do is tell me how I was going to spend that life. They couldn't rob me of the ability to carve out a meaningful existence, no matter where I spent it. And I just went back to my cell that night after the judge pronounced the hearing, and I remember throwing myself on the bunk there in the dark and crying out to God. I said, God, if you let me out of here, I will get out and I will tell the world about you and what you've done. And that was the last prayer that I prayed for a while. After that, my belief in a God who sits high and looks low, slowly faded into frustration and disbelief after hearing that none of my pleas had been heard. At one point, I went around telling anybody who would listen to me that God didn't exist. We created him in our mind. But even as I was running from him, he was somehow managing to be present in my life. Four years of my sentence, still determined to make something of myself, to do something with my time. I chose to sign up for a college program there from a university called Lipscomb in Nashville. And once I got in, I quickly realized that it was so much more than just a curriculum, a college course. I was taken back with how these complete strangers believed in me so much that they were willing to invest in my potential. And beyond that, they provided a community where I belonged. And not because of anything that I did for them, not because or in spite of how I looked, but they accepted me simply because I was me. And their Christian faith told them that was enough. I began to grow in ways I never imagined possible. I finished my associate's degree, I got a bachelor's degree, earning a 4.0 for both of them, and I became a mentor to other women there in the prison. I had gone from wandering the streets of Nashville aimlessly 
to having opportunities to give advice to state legislators on what they should do to change the law for other girls and young women in my same situation. I was literally thriving in a situation that was designed to break me. But what I really wanted was my freedom. I was confident that after spending all the many years I had in the law library, developing relationships with what I deemed to be powerful people, and maintaining a good record there at the institution, that freedom was just a matter of a well-crafted appeal delivered by a seasoned attorney, right? But even with seven, seven of the best attorneys that money could buy, all working pro bono, including a former Court of Criminal Appeals judge and the former Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court, every single court that I went before denied my appeal. My very last appeal was before the federal court and they refused to grant me a habeas and then they also refused to grant me permission to appeal that decision. Any hope that I had of overturning my conviction was essentially dead. But just when I was starting to think that I may never actually get out of prison, God sent me a message. It was January 2017 when I received a letter in the mail from a man in Texas telling me that God is bigger than any judge, jury, or judge on the planet and that he alone had the authority to overturn my sentence. The man told me in so many words that the Lord was saying to prepare myself because I was about to get out of prison. When I told him that I didn't believe in God, he said, that's because you have a medicine, Jesus. I told him I grew up in religion. I know all about that. But the man was telling me that what the Lord desires is relationship. And that was the key word. Relationships had never been my strong point. Everything that I had ever been taught about relationship was transactional. And it always involved me giving way more of myself than anyone else was willing to give in return. When I thought of relationships, I thought about all of the adult men who took advantage of me. I thought of the so-called friends who led me astray, then abandoned me when things went left. But the man from Texas told me that having a relationship with Jesus wasn't about anything that I could give him in return for the level of grace that was awaiting me to simply accept it. On the contrary, there was absolutely nothing that I could possibly do to earn what he was offering. If I gave him my time, my attention, if I devoted myself to him instead of this world, the world that didn't love me back, the pursuits that led to absolutely nowhere, if I would give the Lord just a fraction of that, the man from Texas assured me that I would experience fulfillment unlike anything I had ever experienced in this life. And so I opened myself up to getting to know God in this way. Instead of seeing him through this lens of hurt and disappointment, I started spending time in prayer. I started spending time actually reading his word for myself. And before I knew it, he just began to heal hurts within me that I had carried for over a decade. I rejected all the lies that ever told me that I was shameful, that I was unworthy, and that I would forever be defined by the worst moments and bad decisions that I had made. I embraced the fact that I was forgiven, that I was chosen, that I was set apart by somebody who nobody on this earth could ever override. And even though I was still surrounded by these people who like to use those dark moments to define me and, and, and try to dictate my future, I held firm to what God told me in his word and it made all the difference for me. The man from Texas and I began to grow closer together as we continued writing letters back and forth. And eventually we started talking on the phone every day. He was my best friend in my darkest moments, and I could really be vulnerable with him without fear that he would somehow take advantage of that. Whenever I would tell him that I didn't know if I would ever get out of prison, he would challenge me by saying, there's two reports. There's man's report, and there's God's report. And you're gonna have to make a decision on who you're gonna believe. And in March 2018, God spoke very clearly once again to this man from Texas telling him that I was about to get out. And a few weeks prior, the Lord had told his pastor, Tim McGee, that we would receive a date during the date of March 
during the month of March that had something to do with my release. I had already filed a clemency petition with the governor's office, but we didn't hear anything on it, and I knew that less than 1% of petitions that are filed with the governor's office ever even reach the parole board to have a hearing. But just two weeks later, on the very last day of March, we got word that I was among those less than 1% of applications that was going to get a hearing before the parole board. Now, I've heard stories in the Bible all my life growing up about the Lord speaking to people and showing them things that were actually coming to pass. But for me to sit there and witness for myself, Pastor Tim saying that we would get a date in March, to actually get that date in March, it just left me in awe because it meant that the God of the entire universe was personally handling my case. So when he told that man from Texas that I was going to get out of prison, I would pack my bags because I believed it. And so even though I was once told by a judge and jury that I would be 67 years old before I could ever possibly see the parole board, May 31st, 2018, when I was just 30 years old, I got to meet with the parole board. At this point, it was evident that just as that man from Texas had told me, God alone had the authority to overturn that decision. He was serious. Now, instead of worrying about trying to think my way out of prison, spending hours and hours in the law library, I spent that time getting to know God better and speaking faith to what seemed an impossible situation. In the last few days of 2018, the man from, you know what, I'm just going to give him a name. The man from Texas is Jamie. Uh, right back here, my wonderful husband, um, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie started urging me to go around and speak to the prison walls. Now, I may mean, have looked to other people like I had completely lost my mind, but that's just what I did. I went around and I started speaking to those concrete blocks and telling them that my Father in Heaven said I had been set free and they had no choice but to comply. Then on the morning of January 7, 2019, me walking around looking like a fool actually paid off because they called me down to the visitation gallery to let me know that the governor had decided that I was going to be released from prison. So the very first thing I did, after hearing that news, was marry that man from Texas, <laughs> a.k.a. Jamie, a.k.a. J. Long, the best known as the man who helped me build the faith that freed me, the man who introduced me in a completely different way to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I didn't even wait until I was free. Um, I, we had Pastor Tim marry us from right there prison. I didn't want to waste another day not being his wife. Um, so as I prepare to close, because I know I'm running, running into the time here, I just want you all to know that the reason I said earlier, if you can remember, that I never forget the DA saying that there was nothing more that could be done for me is because every single time I get to stand up here on stage, I get to talk about what he said, and I get to stand here as proof that God can turn any life around. God can turn any situation around. So I hope that my story not only gives you a picture of the factors that contribute to my increased vulnerability to exploitation, the struggles I faced during a time when, you know, knowledge and awareness of what constitutes a CSEC victim was prevalent, and where it is today, but more importantly, I pray that it leaves you inspired, that there's hope. Beyond the data, beyond the rescue-focused rhetoric, beyond evidence-based programming, I pray that you walk away from the summit feeling hopeful and know that when you invite the Lord into your work, when you allow Him to guide your efforts, and when you allow him to be the one who is in charge of the healing work, miraculous things can happen. So I thank you for allowing me to be part of this day here today, um, allowing my husband and I to share this time with you, and to God be the glory. Thank you. Thank you.